today's worldwide general membership meeting of Readers and Writers Book Club will feature a question and answer session with the author of D.B. Cooper, Where Are You? Greetings, I'm Evan Swenson. I'm an author and a book publisher. I'm also a member of Author Masterminds, sponsors of Readers and Writers Book Club. Welcome to Readers and Writers Book Club. This is the worldwide online general membership meeting of Readers and Writers Book Club, rapidly becoming the book club destination for all readers of good books. Thanks for being here. Today's membership is represented online by author mastermind members and other book club members participating on Facebook Live. I hope you'll find every reader is a friend and every author is approachable. Once again, welcome to Readers and Writers Book Club. Of course, we'll be conversing about books, authors, writing, and the magic and miracle of reading. And we'll have some fun as we award Readers and Writers Book Club branded door prizes available to all book club members. Okay, let's meet today's co-hosts. Okay, let's meet today's co-hosts and a Readers and Writers Book Club member. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see, we have Walter Grant here today. Uh, we're going to introduce him as someone else, D.B. Cooper. <laughs> and uh, Marianne uh, Paul, Syl Gergor, and Darlene Miller. Welcome, Darlene. We're pleased Thank to you. find us. I didn't know I was going to be live. I thought I was just going to hear you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> We're glad that you're here. I think you're going to have fun today along with us. Uh, it, it's, it's been fun kind of uh, uh, preparing for this uh, event, uh, knowing uh, we're going to talk with uh, Walter. And I, I suspect that uh, each of you have uh, brought uh, questions uh, that you'd like to to uh, ask uh, D.B. Cooper. Uh, of course, uh, D.B. is the uh, author of uh, D.B. Cooper, Where Are You? <laughs> and uh, it's a, I just wanted to just to sh show the cover of this book one time. So that everyone can get a chance to see that. <laughs> so there's D.B. Cooper's uh, book, In Case of an Emergency, Why I Break the Glass. So this sounds like an emergency. So let's break the gl glass. Who would like to break the ice and ask the first question of uh, D.B. Cooper? I'll ask a question. Okay, still so jump I right in there. I know that you have been interviewed and questioned and drilled by the FBI. What was the toughest question that you had to answer during that investigation? I can't say there was one that was really tough. I mean, you either live it or you didn't, you know it and you don't. But one thing I have a problem with, of course, is everybody wants to know, eventually they'll ask, are you really D.B. Cooper? Well, you know, I'll have to give you an answer here that uh, goes back to a uh, grand jury in uh, Portland. The last day before the statute of limitations ran out, they filed against D.B. Cooper, even though they don't know who D.B. Cooper is. So if ever they can prove I'm D.B. Cooper or I admit to being D.B. Cooper uh, under sworn, under oath, then I could be tried. But uh, that's, I have to consider that before I answer those questions like that. And, uh, but there was nothing really tough. I mean, um... well, how did you get out of the Columbia River? That's a very fast moving, dangerous river. 
it is, and I almost didn't get out. I almost I had hypothermia, and I got out, and I had I would have died if I hadn't flashed back to when I was in the Navy, and this old boatswain chief was lecturing everybody about giving up. He said, "You give up and you die. You know, you fight it. You may have a chance." So. I remember we had to learn to take our pants off and make buoys. I mean, you know, life vests out of them, blowing them up. So that got me ashore. And then by then I was I was freezing because Columbia River was very cold at the time. And I was freezing after I jumped out of the plane. Um, and uh, then I had to wade through a bunch of briars and I saw a light and I got up to a street and I saw uh, an outside light on and I checked the house it was empty and there was an attached garage so I just opened up the door to the garage and it wasn't locked and I walked in found a sleeping bag took off my clothes got in it crawled in the front seat of an old truck and <laughs> but it finally got warm and uh, so yeah I, I almost died in the river I, I was going to ask about the statute of limitations. Isn't it 50 years now? But you just mentioned statute of limitations. Did they? Well, they, they vary a difference of the crime. For mine was uh, five, was it 15 or five years? I don't remember now. But it's uh, it has to do more with uh, uh, interstate crimes. So when I left Oregon and flew into Washington, that made it interstate. And so they were able to file and they didn't file just one, you know, uh, didn't put out just one warrant for me. They were like about three for every passenger and because I endangered these people and endangered the crew. And then there was the uh, trying to defraud the uh, Northwest Orient and, just a whole bunch of them. So there are, there are all sorts of things that could be tried for. Let's, uh, before we go on, let's uh, put a little background here. Uh, this one didn't happen just yesterday, Walter. This is what, the 50th anniversary of when you bailed out of the airplane? Come, tw come 24 November this year, be 50 years. Day before Thanksgiving. Day before Thanksgiving. It was cold. In Oregon. It was very cold. Yeah. And I had anticipated it would be cold when I jumped. So I'd wrapped up, I'd layered up. And but before I could get out of the plane, it was, I was just perspiring. I was wet, you know, of things against my skin. And then when I hit that cold air out there, everything froze. And well, there were a couple of things. You know, I asked for a couple of sets of parachutes. Well, one of them, uh, I'd been warned about Candy, and she, well, she really got into this when she found out she was going to get $2 million. But, uh, and there's a little story there. But uh, I cut one of the parachutes, uh, the crowd lines, and tied it around me and attached it to a, a chair on the, in the plane. And... Uh, before I opened the door because I was afraid I might get sucked out. And then the other one I put underneath, I don't know if, if this was just uh, because the sails were weak or what, but the stairs kept creeping up. And I stuck this pair, I walked down and stuck a parachute under to keep it from continually creeping up. So when I finally decided it was time to jump, I walked down to the end of the stairs, and about that time, that shoe came loose and knocked me off the stairs. And I was tumbling and spinning and had no idea what was up and what was down because it was pitch black outside. And uh, it took me a while to get stabilized. And then I had to, I lost count of when I jumped out of the planes. And I finally had to say, I'd better pull that cord now. And if I'd have waited another second, I would have. Yeah, I would have. I wouldn't have splattered. I would have <laughs> smacked into the ground on the. I would have smacked into the ground on the south side of the river. Walter, you said two parachutes. Now, uh, well, there were two sets. Two, okay. two sets of parachutes. 
but that they they were furnished at your request. They were furnished by the airlines. Well, they? yeah, that was that was just uh, to throw them off track. Uh, I had no intention of using any of their equipment because I thought it might be the rig to not open, which I found out that one of the pair uh, the riggers was approached to do that and asked to do that. He wouldn't do it. He said that's premeditated murder. But I knew there would be beacon in it if I popped the, you know, you know, the ripcord in one of those. There'd be a beacon that would go off, and the helicopters and searchlights would be there almost immediately. So uh, I wasn't going to use their shoot. Oh. And two, two, I wanted a smaller shoot. What? Pardon? You didn't just jump out. You had a parachute. Oh yeah, Candy put that on, and she got on in uh, Mazola, Montana. And uh, she got off in Portland. I got on, and the bag was still there. She left it. Is it uh, uh, a lopo from the uh, security parachute company would fit into a NB6 carrier and fit into carry on luggage? So, but you know, thinking back again about it. I could have probably just walked on with a parachute because sports jumping clubs were just getting started. And I don't think there was any regulation about taking a parachute onto a commercial airplane. But, uh, but anyway, I played it safe. As it turned out, it wasn't all that safe. <laughs> so any other, any other questions at D.B. Cooper that, they, that you, you brought here that you just die to ask? What? Where's the money? <laughs> That's usually the first question. <laughs> Where and you the already money? know it's in the Columbia River. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the way it's in the Columbia River, when I realized I wasn't going to be able to avoid splashing down, I unbuckled my harness and, and kept my arms crossed and just sat back in my seat. Sometimes people think that you hang underneath the parachute, but you don't. You sit in the harness. So when I felt my feet touch the water, I just put my arms up, it slid right up. The money was attached to the parachute horn. So that's how I got into the river. And uh, those two kids that found, uh, I don't know, six or $8,000 in a sandbar would have probably found it all if they'd have kept looking. Have you gone back and looked for the rest after those I've kids? I've never found? been there. Well, especially since they came up and said, well, they had numbers on it to trace it back. So I knew then they had, they had recorded all the numbers. But I wasn't concerned. I figured they would do that, but I wasn't really concerned about $20 bills. I mean, nobody ever asks you about a, to, to sign for a $20 bill. But if you tried to cash 100 back in 1970, 71, 72, would have asked for a signature normally, and they'd check the serial number, all sorts of things. But when is that was a common bill? Now hundreds are common. So how did you convince the FBI that you're innocent? Well, they can't prove I'm guilty, so they're not going to come after me. I was okay. Now this probably shouldn't share this with you, but I met a met a guy and. Uh, in Anchorage when I had my little business there at the Elmendorf Exchange. And he came by and he had one of my books, the first one that had been published. And uh, full timing, it was about a cat and they had found this cat and they loved the book. So he came by and I said, where did you get that? He said, we got it in the exchange. And so Evan had arranged to sell them in the exchange and I was selling them <laughs> myself. But anyway, turned out he was FBI. And we talked a bit and we became friends. I thought he was my friend, but then he turned in my, my prologue to the, uh, his boss. And uh, I don't know how much they watched or how much they tracked me or what they figured out, but I don't think they had any idea of how they could convict me. Uh, I didn't leave any fingerprints. I threw everything over. They claimed that I left that clip on tie for from pennies, which I got at a Salvation Army store, uh, and it had DNA. Well, if they had DNA, did they have a reason to check me? Who knows? If they didn't, or they could have gotten it. So there was so much mixed up in that. So I think I threw it out. 
Do you still hear from the FBI from time to time? Is it well, I haven't heard from from him in a long time. I don't. Uh, I kind of lost contact with my friend, and then uh, they haven't bugged me. They gave up on me. The rest of the FBI. So when I left Anchorage, I pretty much left the FBI behind. Darlene uh, Miller, you're uh, you're representing uh, the book club membership here, I guess. The other folks that are here are authors. You're, you're an author too. Uh, you've written books, and we know that. But uh, have you got any questions, Darlene, that you're just dying to ask D.B. Cooper? <coughs> well, how did he get the money in the first place? Well, I wrote the when I okay. I boarded the plane in Portland, between Portland, after it rotated, maybe 30 minutes after that, I passed a note to one of the stewardesses. And uh, actually I gave it to Florence, I called her Flo. But uh, the, one of the other stewardess uh, kind of took over, Tina Mudlock or whatever her name was. And uh, I understand, I, th I think she thought she could see glory and dollars in her eyes on the back of her lids there because I understand now she's coming out with a movie. <laughs> so as the hero, as the heroine. But anyway, uh, I had a note on there saying I wanted $200,000 and the two sets of parachutes. But originally my girlfriend thought she was gonna get $2 million. But I thought about it. I said, there's no way they're going to be able to get $2 million together in a short period of time. As a matter of fact, they didn't get $200,000 together. They shorted me to about $20,000. But uh, they, uh, then I, I gave them the note. The pilot came back and looked at my bomb. And they all agreed that uh, they would give me the money. Well, you, you had a bomb. You was carrying a bomb on the board. Well, it wasn't a real bomb. I wasn't going to take a chance of blowing myself up. I mean, I, I was dumb, but I wasn't <laughs> double dumb. <laughs> You're crazy, but not stupid. How's that? Uh, that's it. That's it. TV? <laughs> and anyway, but they gave me the money. They, they, I exchanged the, the, some of the, the passengers for the money. I let them get off. In fact, we landed at SeaTac. Uh, and... Uh, then I let all the crew go except the pilot, co-pilot, and one stewardess. And somehow, I always thought it was Flo. I like Flo. I think she'd be like me. But Tina kind of took over, so I think she thought in the beginning she saw some way to make some money. But hey, you know. So did two. anyone else get, did anyone get hurt? Nobody got hurt. Nobody lost anything except their time and Northwest story. Hmm. So there, there was really, uh, that was one of the things I didn't want anybody. I didn't want a, a gun. I didn't want, although the bomb was a threat and that's what the, uh, what is it? The Hobbs Commission or whatever it was that uh, filed a suit because it, I threatened them all with the bomb. But anyway, hey. It worked out. I'm still here. They're all happy. Yeah, I've got a question for you. Yes, one, sir. One of the uh, one. Am I? Can you hear me? Am I live? I can hear you. Yeah. One of the one of the uh, the nagging points that came up in the investigation. This is over the years. Is that when you got onto the plane, you weren't dressed in a parka with fat boy pants and bunny boots. Not so, a chance. You went out the back. <laughs> you went out that back staircase, and you were basically in civilian dress. And that is a long way down to the ground, and it gets really cold, cold falling. So, did you have underwear on there, or did you know it was going to be that cold? <laughs> oh, I, I knew it was going to be cold. I had, I had silk actually. Uh, Candy put me onto the ballet tights that she used to wear. She got me a couple pairs of those, and then I used those neoprene underwear, and also wool. And then I had on a my clothes and a, and a top coat, but it was still when I hit that cold air out there, all that perspiration froze. It was like I was an icicle. I mean, really. 
that was a long way down. How long is well, you you fell for what a good minute, minute and a half? Well, I, I had them I had them fly dirty, knowing they can instruct them to stay below ten thousand feet, and that way they couldn't get across the mountains. And uh, the problem I had was I was going to carry an, an altimeter, but I realized. I wouldn't know whether it was over a hill or a valley, so it wouldn't do me any good. And I thought about calling the pilot up and asking him what his uh, radar altimeter said. And I thought, I just better get out of here. And I saw some lights, and I thought they were lights at Aerial Dam, so I jumped. Well, I didn't get, actually jump. I walked down to jump, got knocked off by the parachute that I had stuffed under there. No, you, could, you could have come down in a river or a lake. How did you know you were going to come down in the forest? I didn't come down in the forest. I came down in the Columbia River. Did you land in the river? In the river. That's where all the money is if you want to go look for it. And it's attached to the parachute and the harness. Yeah, but that's got to be pretty cold after falling down. Then you fell into the river. I almost froze to death. I had hypothermia by the time I got out, found a place to crawl into a warm spot mm -hmm. and uh, if I it's I'm very fortunate that I didn't die in the river mm -hmm. did you plan to die in the river or that I, to drop into the river or that's just the way that it worked out no I, I thought I was going to drop around uh, the aerial dam because I knew uh, the Lewis R R River Valley like the back of my hand because I'd worked for a warehouse for two years there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I planned to drop exactly where they thought I did. I don't know if I, maybe it sucked me along with a, nobody had ever jumped out of a 727 before. And uh, so I'm not sure how, what, if it, it sucked me along or what happened there. But I thought the lights I saw was the Aerial Dam. That was only 30 miles north of the river mm -hmm. so you know I, I don't have an explanation of really how i got into the river mm -hmm. unless i just thought it uh, saw the lights at the airport and mistook them for the one that the aerial dam mm -hmm. what uh walter whatever put you up to this anyway db why would you even consider something like that you never I met candy did you <laughs> <laughs> She had her way of getting things, but she was, I felt sorry for her really. She grew up in La Jolla, California, had it all, had everything. She was every mother's dream little girl. And then she got messed up with the surfers and the guys, the Bohemian, you Bohemians hanging out at the Pacific Beach. And before you knew it, she was wearing, you know, bells on her ankles and painting her face and with flowers and she dropped out of school and got into dope and uh, she followed the way up everybody everything seemed to be just a step ahead of her the good times are all where she had people had left that's where she just arrived so she finally ended up in uh, Juneau and uh she decided she had to go cold turkey. She was down to her last penny. And uh, so she paid up a room at one of the motels there. And I can't remember what she told me about that one. And uh, locked herself in, flushed the keys. And uh, she knew she'd either die or, you know, break out of a habit. And uh, one of the attendants found her and she was almost dead. They called her, she finally told them where she, who her parents were. They called her, he called them, and they came and got her, took her home for a while. And uh, she just couldn't fit in. And she stole some, whatever money she could find was laying around the house and her mother's jewelry and uh, took off of Colorado. And uh, ended up in Tacoma, ended up on a, uh, Page in the Poplitz Bar dancing. That's where she, I met her. And, and she was a witch. She, she cast me a spell over me and it was over. I'd do anything she asked. Even jump out of an airplane in the night. 
<laughs> and I had, had to be a, a spell, don't you think? <laughs> I wouldn't have done. But I, I, I felt sorry for her. I liked her. Uh, I don't know how, how I couldn't break away. I just couldn't break away from her. Have you kept and in it, contact with her? Well, no, she committed suicide. And uh, at what age? Well, it was 39. Mm. She had been telling me she would never reach 40. And uh, she she actually betrayed me. And uh, this one guy that was a relative to who, who was known at the time was the Island Godfather. And uh, he was into dealing dope. So uh, she sold it to him. That was part of the deal. I thought that was good. But when he came over and uh, took the dope and uh, took a few shots at me as I was running into the jungle, and uh, she left with him, I knew that uh, it was over. So I, I just left everything in Hawaii that uh, I owned. Well, not that I owned, because I had a lot of property that I had bought with money I had made selling crazy weed. and. Uh, uh, so I left and uh, went to the Philippines for a while and came back and found her. She had written me a letter telling me that she was going to commit suicide or that she had. And so when I went down to identify the body, uh, you know, that was it. I decided I would uh, seek revenge on the guy, which I did. And I left Hawaii for good. Walter, you mentioned Hawaii. Uh, what is uh, what has this got to do? You sent me this. <coughs> what has this got to do with uh, with your time in Hawaii? Actually, this is a World War One memorial. It's a saltwater swimming pool. It's called an auditorium, and this is where I used to meet. Well, after we got to Hawaii, okay, after I jumped out of the plane, got to the hotel where Candy was waiting and she was really upset with me. Didn't talk to me for a week. But finally we got to Hawaii, we had reservations to an aircraft to Hawaii out of Portland. And uh, well, we had to fly to Seattle from there, I guess, because they didn't fly directly to Portland. And, um, uh, so anyway, she she got out of she she got over it, losing the money, and uh, so I went up. We went up the North Shore, and I still had a little left because I had, this can go on because I had uh, I had a after how far do you want to take this? When I <laughs> when I <laughs> um, okay, I got out of the Navy. And a divorce at the same on the same day, and uh, then I met up with a couple of uh, guys that were going to bike to uh, Alaska and uh, work for the canneries. So I went along with them, and uh, we worked for the canneries, and we all sold our bikes and flew back home and bought new bikes. Well, I. Uh, I stopped and took, took a ride down the Redwood Highway and found some little cute hippie girl that wanted to go any place as long as I'd buy her marijuana and wine. And uh, so when I ran out of money, I sold the bike. And, and where were we going with this? <laughs> well, anyway. I, I thought I would go back next this, next the following summer to uh, Alaska and work the uh, canneries again. But I didn't have a bike or very, very little money. So I stole a bike, got caught, spent a year in the Hatchapi prison, and I was going to hitchhike back after I got out. I figured it would just set me back a year. And uh, some trucker picked me up, told me by the time I got to Alaska, it would be wintertime. If I was hitchhiking and uh, I might try getting work with wise, uh, a warehouse. So I did that. That's how I came up with uh, 
the idea of uh, jumping into uh, the Lewis River Valley. And this all and happened, Walter, then before you met Candy? No, this, this, this was, was all, oh years. yes, yes, that happened before I met Candy. I didn't meet her. Okay, so I had a lot of problems with poachers, okay? So I shot one, I thought, but it turned out to be a narc. So I figured I had to get out of town. So I took the ferry to Chuno and then flew back. <laughs> and uh, then I went back to, I was planning on going back home to the, I grew up in the Panhandle, but I went to El Paso and uh, I opened an account there and with a bank and a bank box and put different amounts of money in them. And, uh, because I'd had a pretty good year even before I, I'd saved my money from the past couple of years from selling uh, marijuana. And uh, then I hired this to talk to a next door neighbor and mother and asked if her daughter could clean my house. And she said she'd do it for $50 a week. She'd iron my clothes and all that sort of thing. Well, as it turned out, the girl was willing to do a bit more than clean house and wash and iron. She was underage, so the judge said, well, you know, you can go into the army or you can go to prison. Didn't leave me with much choice. And uh, he had people, MPs there from uh, uh, Fort Bliss to take me back. <laughs> and, and, and I was volunteered for the army. They sent me to Fort Lewis. That's how I got to Fort Lewis and that's where I met I met uh, Candy. She was, like I said, dancing in a smoky dive on the south side of Tacoma. And uh, I don't know about uh, the other authors here. And Darlene, do we really want to be acquainted with D.B. Cooper and uh, <laughs> Mary? I was, I was wondering what his mother would think about this. <laughs> this is something you want your children to do. <laughs> She passed away. Well, my children, no. But my mother passed away before I ever wrote the book. So. Uh, <laughs> Probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't have believed it anyway. She would have thought somebody else wrote it and put my name on it. You know, her child, had only, she couldn't do any wrong. <laughs> Walter, you sent me this photograph. What's this? Is a, a place in Hawaii? What is well, that? Well, yeah, it's on the Big Island. Well, the reason we ended up there after I got busted with uh, in Hawaii for selling pot didn't really get. <laughs> I mean, they just found out my found my operation, but before that, I had talked Candy into buying a uh, condo at. at uh, uh, Puhulu. And uh, it was right on the water. She could surf, do whatever she wanted. And it was easy for me to walk up and climb up into the uh, mountains and uh, where I grew pot in the uh, uh, lava tubes and uh, with, with lights, which I used the water there for pressure. So <laughs> we were going through into Kanaelia one morning. And I saw the mountain was all helicopters and all of that. So I figured I was busted. So she wanted to sell her place. She said it, it wasn't as big as her bedroom that she had in La Jolla. And she was probably right. But anyway, we went to the big island. And she wanted to buy a place at uh, La Jolla town, which was the hippie town that uh, that it was what once been a sugarcane company town. And that's the way I put that there because of the show how the hippies came in, they renovated this place and painted it all up in their, their colors and started making homemade stuff to sell. And, and, uh, and this obviously was uh, not a picture I took because you can see that Dodge is a fairly new vehicle. But uh, I don't think any of them had anything bigger than a Volkswagen bus. And, uh, but it was a cute little town. They had it all painted up and tours used to go through. 
the tour people would take fake people through their town and let them out, and they'd buy all the hippie stuff. And and uh, now I understand it's just another town, and they're about to, you know, it's just about all gone. But anyway, that's where we were living when I was growing it on the Big Island. So you were in agriculture on the Big Island. And uh, <laughs> I was in agriculture, yeah. DB, a couple of your uh, author friends are here, Victoria and Valerie. Uh, and I'm talking with those them earlier. I know that they have some uh, questions. As, as uh, Victoria and uh, Valerie, as Walter answered your questions, or are you still have some things you'd like to inquire of DB Cooper? Well. For, for me, I remember seeing the name, you know, I mean, it was 50 years ago. And 50 right. years ago, I was, gosh, 50 years ago, well, I didn't do the pot. <laughs> <laughs> I had a job. I was working in LA. Um, and I, I don't know that I followed the story other than it, you know, the fact that the idiot jumped out of a plane. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God. So like, now you've met the idiot. No, yeah, I'm talking <laughs> to the idiot that jumped out of a plane. <laughs> and you ended up with nothing. I'm Correct? sorry? You ended up with nothing. With nothing. Well, an experience that I didn't care to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't lose 50 years of your life in the slammer either. No, I didn't. Oh, that's, I, I think that's the most, I, I doubt that I would have gotten over five years had they had they tried me and found me guilty. I mean, as uh, Evan said before, nobody was hurt. Nobody yes. lost anything except Northwest Orion well, and a little somebody, time. Somebody for lost 200,000 bucks, right? Pardon? Somebody lost 200,000 bucks. Insurance paid it. Well, they really did. And what happened? You know, I, I, they shorted me. Now, I didn't know this because I didn't get a chance to count the money. Of but I met up yeah. when I was after, while well, I had my little business there at Elmendorf. Uh, then we had published a book and I had it for sale. And this guy came through and he said, uh, he started up a conversation and said, uh, then he finally admitted that he was a pilot for Northwest Orion and that he had landed and saw the plane sitting over there in the, out of the way in a lighted area and he wondered what, we, what it was doing there. So I, we talked about it a little bit. And every time I would say something like that, he'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he turned and got almost to the door and he came back and said, all right, give me one of your books. So I sold him a book. Two days later, he came back and bought four more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and, what I want to know, DB, is they um, they did a rendering, they did a picture based on, I think it was the uh, flight attendants uh, gave a description of you and they came up with a rendering of what a D.B. Cooper is supposed to look like. And I don't think it looks like you. Well, that's what Flo said when they asked him, when I sat down beside her, they asked me if that, asked her if, I was the guy, she said no. The FBI had, had her in and asked. And I don't, I don't understand that, not that I were, I mean, I can't remember everything because things were moving pretty fast there, but I gave the note to Flo or Florence uh, Schaefer, last name. And this other flight attendant kind of took over, took the note away from her and started, uh, talking with the pilot and talking with me. I don't know if she had any idea about writing her book after she got out of that or not, but now I understand she's uh, considering making a movie. Well, I hope she gets your looks right because you're much better looking than that guy they drew a picture of. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'll send you the money. How much do you oh, want? Oh, great. That's super. <laughs> So, Walter, th this is a rendition then that uh, she was talking about. Uh, how close does that look like you? 
Well, I mean, at that time, did it or? Well, I, I haven't aged much since then. So, I mean, physically, <laughs> I mean, I'm That's older, great. but I haven't gotten any older, for, you know, uh, as far as the, my visual. This is the guy in the, it, it's, it's all over. This, this is the picture of, of uh, D.B. Cooper on the cover of your book. And uh, they're all over other places just as well, are they not? Here's, here's a picture of a bunch of D.B. Cooper books that uh, yours is one of them in there, but I see that picture a couple or three different places on there, uh, the same picture. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the one that the FBI had. Uh, is, that, is that what you looked like then or not? Well, I mean, you know, they, so they drew this, or they had an artist draw it while Flo and Tina were telling them what I looked like. So this was from their memory and what the artists conceived they were telling them. Well, yeah, but the question I have, Walter, is that you were out doing things and doing things that would draw attention to the, to the officers. They were selling illegal products. But like they, had no, had, they, they, they had no idea. The edge anyway. oh, they had no idea. They had no idea. That, uh, that they'd have this picture out there that they'd recognize you and pick you up. They had no idea that I was in the part of the country where I was. They, they were still looking around uh, Washington and Oregon. But they really, according to the, the FBI agent that we became friends, uh, he said that they're never going to take D.B. Cooper to court because they were embarrassed not being able to find me to begin with. They don't want to be embarrassed a second time and not being able to get a conviction. So they really didn't want to find me. So they're giving lip service to this idea that they would like to solve this only unsolved? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Did you ever go to a D.B. Cooper? One of the, they, every once in a while, they have a D.B. Cooper day where everybody shows up dressed like D.B. <laughs> Did you ever go to one of those? After I met Sue Ann, I had moved back to the, the continental U.S. Uh, I had bought a motor home and I had the urge to do this. And that's where I was on my way to their reunion when I found her. Uh, some trucker kicked her out of his rig, and uh, so I looked her over. She was okay, and she looked me over, and she said, would you take me home? And I said, uh, well, sure. Where do you live? She said, no, I mean home with you. And so that's, I was stuck with another one. But anyway, she was okay. <laughs> she was okay. But we went to the, <coughs> the aerial store, and I went, I found some old clothes at Salvation Army, an old suit and the tie and the glasses and the whole bit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so uh, there was a guy there that was packing heat. I think he was uh, fed. He, he probably figured I would show up sooner or later, but he didn't recognize me or he didn't want to recognize me. But anyway, the store owner who was holding the contest didn't think I looked as much like DB as one of the other guys. So I lost. I finished third. <laughs> so if I run the, into you on the street at that time, Walter, and I had the photograph there, I wouldn't look at the photograph and look at you and say, yeah, that's the guy. I don't think so. Going to do it again? Uh, no, it was too how much work. Oh, and to, uh, and oh. the payoff wasn't worth it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions that uh, anyone would like to ask of uh, D.B. Cooper? I just want to say T. Martin O'Neill said, great job, D.B. Keep up the great writing. <laughs> yeah, D.B., <laughs> when, when did you realize, D.B., that you were, you were an author extraordinaire? When did you, uh, did you always write and, and that's what made you want to tell the D.B. story or... Well, I just wanted to, actually, I, I wanted to keep 
DB a mystery, but then also I wanted to expose him. So I was torn between those two things with writing about DB. But as far as my writing started, it was in fourth grade. I uh, this had a little girl in fourth grade was the cutest thing I had seen in my entire life, all 10 years of it. <laughs> you know? So, but she would have nothing to do with me if I tried to talk with her, speak to her, she flip her curls and stick her nose in the air and turn around and walk away. Oh, one after one of those girl flipping events, I heard this voice said, write her a poem. I looked around and there was the devil sitting on my shoulder. <laughs> so I did it. I stole, I pretty much stole the, what became of the, uh, known as the Valentine poem. You know, the roses are red, violets are blue. But I rearranged it so that you really couldn't tell. I used her name a lot and that sort of thing. I left it on her desk. And uh, she found it and read it, looked at me and showed it to her little girlfriend. The little girlfriend looked at me and smiled. Then she didn't say anything the rest of the day, but the next day she brought two cookies that her brother had baked here with me at recess. So that's when I realized I could write. <laughs> but, but poetry was too restricted. I mean, too many rules back then. So I switched to short stories. Seemed the High school girls like the short stories too, which got me in big trouble. But you know, I managed. <laughs> well, okay, I had a had a minister and his wife that kind of took me under the, their wings and managed to make a help me make a U turn on the devil's highway. And uh, so that's how I'm here today. I hate to think of what would have happened to me, and. Uh, and I stayed on the road, I was traveling. So uh, any of you that would like to buy one of uh, DB's books, we're selling them for five cookies each. How <laughs> many would you like? <laughs> <laughs> we know that Make DB likes cookies more than money. When he had a chance to have 200 grand, what did he do? He lost it. Well, it was, yeah, that was, I. <laughs> I did lose it. I did lose it. And I worked for hard, hard for that too. Oh man! So wages of sin. We, we're 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 looking forward to having uh, other authors uh, attend our uh, monthly meeting and visit with them. I'm not sure that uh, we're going to get uh, quite as much. Uh, what do you need? Background. Uh, to, the, with them as, <laughs> that we've got uh, with you. So, uh, Sil and Valerie, v Victoria, Marianne, <laughs> are, are you DB is, DB is too off. hard an act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to follow DB. <laughs> Especially us animal writers, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not I hope a, a dog one. or a pony follow that. <laughs> Well, stay with the animals, stay with the dogs, because Charlene's cat has outsold any of the other books I have written. As a matter well, of fact, I, I think I have two or three fact, left. I just put a cat in the next book. What a what? Why not a cat? You know, cat and a horse. Oh, oh, okay. I thought you had a dog. I figured you couldn't have a horse without a dog. Well, you can't, but you know, sometimes you end up with something strange, you know. Cats <laughs> <laughs> are different. They, they like cats, I guess. I don't know. So the question I have everybody else, when you sit down to the dinner table tonight, or you make a post on the internet, having had this experience, uh, what are you gonna tell your husband, wife, companion, friend, whoever it is? I had a interviewed today with D.B. Cooper, and they're going to say, what? <laughs> you're going to tell them, yeah, it was really him? <laughs> or are you going to say, well, Walter Grant has a good story, but he's not D.B. Cooper. So you're going to walk <laughs> away and, uh, and say, yeah, you're convinced that uh, 
Walter pulled one over on the FBI and Northwest Airlines. And, and, uh, and you know he had all the right, he had answers for every question. Well, I somebody defy. did it. Somebody did it. It might just as well have been Walter. Yeah. <laughs> right. I defy what? you to ask Walter any question about D.B. Cooper that he cannot immediately answer. And you can ask him five, 10 years later and he'll have the same response. Well, somebody asked me once if I uh, had to uh, research D.B. a lot to write the story. And I said, well, you know, if you live it, you don't have to research it. And that's kind of where I stand with that. <laughs> oh, Walter. <laughs> well, when did you decide to change your name to Walter? <laughs> Nobody knows DB's real name. Okay, I'll tell you how DB came about. Nobody knows DB's real name, except me, of course. Um, but when I bought the ticket under Dan Cooper in Portland, some reporter had they had a problem with a had an arrested a guy by the name of DB Cooper that lived in the Seattle area. Or they had a problem. There was something that came up about him. So the reporter told the FBI. So it was probably D.B. Cooper. It was probably D.B. Cooper. So that's uh, the name stuck. So nobody knows my name. Except so me. you never gave your name to anybody. Write D.B. Cooper down on the paper on the plane? No, I didn't write my name on the plane. I just told them what I wanted. And, you know, that's well, how, how did I want to talk. In? Did you check? Did, in those days, did they ask you just for ID or anything in those days? They didn't. Well, no, not at, not when I bought the ticket. I just wanted to know what my name was and if I had the cash. And uh, I told him it was Dan Cooper. Actually, I, uh, I kind of, you know, messed up a little bit there with the, the ticket agent asked me what my name was. So it flashed back, and I hadn't been out of the Navy that long. And, uh, you know, when you're in the service of any kind, you fill out all these this paperwork every day to get anything you need. And it's first name, last, last name, first, middle initial. So he said, what's your name? I said, Cooper. And then I realized what had happened. So I said, Dan Cooper. And that's how Dan Cooper got to be on the whatever. Dan Cooper wasn't the name either. When was the last time the FBI talked to you? Oh, 30 years ago. Oh, okay. Did you ever get your did you ever get your FBI file? No. Why don't you apply for it? See what it says. Pardon? Why don't you apply for it? It's free. Why don't you apply for it and see what it says? I figured. I figure the less I have to do with the FBI, the better off I am. Okay. So they might just ask, well, why are you interested in your file? You say it's none of your business. <laughs> and then they say, well, we're not going to give it to you. <laughs> oh your name's Walter Grant and you're a writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think the FBI will eventually be investigating the club? Who knows? I'm going to give you a little, little freebie here. When I started writing the club, the pilot on 305 oh, was a nice guy. He was good to me. Matter of fact, when I was ready to chop and open the door, he came over to the PA and said, is there anything uh, we can do for you? So I got on the phone and just said no. But I thought, well, you know, I'll just give him a character. So I made him the lead character in the series. His last name was Scott. I didn't use the same name because then I could get in trouble with that. But his name was George, I think, or, and, uh, or Kenneth or George or something like that. And uh, So the and pilot got... from D.B. Cooper Northwest Airlines <laughs> hijacker airplane. The pilot from that airplane is now a character in your book. Well, no, he's just the name. I just use him for a name. So. 
He's a name. No, he has nothing to do. He's, I don't know if he's alive or not. I don't know if any of them. I think uh, the one stewardess says, but I don't know about Flo or, and I don't even remember the other girl's name. I think it was Alice something. And uh, uh, I think the co pilot's name was Rivichek or Rivichek or something like that. Well, Walter, this has been uh, <laughs> kind of fun. You and I have known each other for a long time, and I learned a lot about you today. <laughs> but I'm not sure that I wanted to learn. But <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll see everyone uh, next month at this meeting, and one of the author mastermind members will share the spotlight. We'll look forward to seeing them uh, at that time. And But uh, in the meantime, uh, we'd uh, just like you to keep in touch with us and the other author mastermind members, uh, keep participating on the uh, Readers and Writers Book Club. Uh, we're just uh, pleased that you're here and that we're able to share authors and their stories with you and us. It's just been really fun being here. Thank you again. We'll talk with you uh, again. Well, I guess one month from now. Even time.